Hello, and welcome to Sam Conversations. The subject for this episode is predictable. The 20th anniversary of 9-11, which will be differently observed, recalled in most parts of the world, but it will also be celebrated in Afghanistan by the Taliban. There are many perspectives to 9-11, and in the last three weeks, ever since the United States and the last of the military personnel left Kabul airport, there has been a barrage of commentary about the United States, its credibility, and what the US withdrawal will do to regional geopolitics. Does this mark a triumphalism for the Taliban, a certain ideology that we associate with it? A triumph for Pakistan, which had invested in the Taliban, as also for China, which has been a proxy for Pakistan, there have been many predictable levels of interpretation. But we thought that perhaps we would try and look at the same event in a more reflective way and give it the long-term view, that of a historian. And it's in that context that I'm very privileged and glad to welcome to this conversation, Professor Madhavan Palat. Professor Palat was till recently at JNU Jawaharlal Nehru University, and subsequently he has been the editor of the selected works of Jawaharlal Nehru. Welcome to this uh, conversation, Professor Palat. Thank you. What I thought we would do is that I remember in some of our conversations, you know, you have often said, perhaps in lighter vein, but there is a tone of, I would say, academic rigor to it, that the historian is constantly looking backwards. Often, perhaps, you know, in the end notes, the footnotes of history. So my query to you, if I could frame it in that way, is that the US withdrawal from Afghanistan, will it be a mere blip in the long cycle of history? And I'm looking only at 100 years. And to the extent that history does not repeat itself, but we are often told that it does chime and there are rhythms that we should be looking for. My reading as a security analyst is that if you look at the last 100 years, and Afghanistan in particular, the Soviet invasion in Afghanistan in 1979 in many ways marked not only the unraveling of the Soviet Union a decade later, but perhaps one could make a case to say that it was also the beginning of a certain phase, the end of the Cold War and the emergence of what was often described as the post-Cold War, but I'm framing it perhaps from a non-historian's perspective. So using that as a trigger, or as you know, the entry. How would you, as a historian, look at the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan in the end of August, Professor Pala? Thank you, there. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak here. Uh, it is always a pleasure to talk to you about these matters, and we continue our conversations on this. Uh, to answer your question, yes, I think it is actually only a clip. Uh, it is not the dramatic change that it has been presented in the headlines and the press reportage in the recent past. It is a blip because the US has been negotiating with Taliban for the past year. And one point of agreement, of course, was that the US interests were not to be hit. So the US exit and the Taliban entry has been by agreement. It is not a US flight. Ashraf Ghani was a puppet, not in control of his own state. And that was revealed by the manner of the Taliban entry. Afghan forces merely joined the Taliban. They did not even surrender. Taliban is sponsored by Pakistan, or one part of Pakistan, that is the ISI. And Pakistan is a US proxy in this matter. So the Taliban victory is another form of US control not of US defeat. It is US just shifting gear, as it were. And the US is withdrawing to satisfy a domestic opinion, just as it entered to satisfy domestic opinion after 9-11. Taliban is not Al-Qaeda. It was a useful and 
the Taliban was held guilty, although Pakistan is much more guilty, especially for harboring Osama bin Laden. So the adventure in Afghanistan was just to placate a domestic concern. Otherwise, America has always been in control after the exit of the Soviet Union. That situation has not changed. This is very interesting, Madhavan. The fact that you, I think, I haven't heard anyone else say this, that August 31st and the US exit, the last military personnel, there was a Marine Corps general who boarded the military aircraft, which is the image that was repeatedly shown. You are describing this, and please correct me if I'm wrong, as actually a US victory, <laughs> that it is not a defeat. So if yeah. I take that broad sense that, you know, it is not what is being made out to be in the headlines and that the United States had arrived at a deal with the Taliban, Doha, all of that is the background. But I want to pursue this a little more. Now, there is another set of commentary, and you see this again in many of the more respected journals, websites globally, largely, I would say, driven by the English uh, US, I would say, think tanks and their affiliates, that this is the return of the jihadi ideology, a triumphalism for the Taliban, whatever the Taliban had espoused, as also the Al-Qaeda, and more recently, the Islamic State. And there have been a lot of references to Khorasan and the regional variant of the Islamic State. So I'm framing this question in this manner, saying that there was very deep anxiety in the period 2000, roughly six, seven, from the time we had the emergence of the Daesh, the Islamic State in West Asia, and an enormous amount of concern when they had actually controlled territory, vast swathes of territory, Syria, and towards, I would say, east of Syria, into Iraq. And the fact, of course, that many cities were taken over by the Daesh. And at that time, there was anxiety that this is the beginning of the caliphate, the Islamic Emirate, et cetera, et cetera, which is subscribing to terrorism. But we know that in West Asia, there was a lot of turbulence, bloodshed, lives were lost, and the Daesh was pushed back. And they were defeated. You had everyone involved there. You had the Russians, you had the Americans, you had the local powers and all of that. The Taliban now declaring itself as the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan and making it very clear that they are not going to shift as far as their commitment to the ideology is concerned. How would you as a historian see this? You know, is there any parallel here, any correspondence? Or again, is it part of a blip that the Taliban and the United States are in some very, very opaque kind of orchestra? Madhavan? Yeah. Uh, you see, the uh, uh, a restoration or revival of jihad uh, is simply not the question, because it was always there. It was the Americans who had supported the jihad against the Soviet Union. They had virtually created it with Pakistani help. So from the 1980s, it has been going on. America has been behind it. And now America pushes forward, moves backward, moves sideways. It is just moving around in the same area. But the jihad is part, is one of the American instruments to use in uh, Afghanistan. So it is nothing, uh, it is not some grand new uh, Islamic jihad that is going to sweep the world starting from Afghanistan of all places. That's the least likely possibility. Afghanistan has absolutely no resources. Taliban has no resources except the capacity to export or to engage in some terror, not even to export it, I think. It has very limited resources. So in what sense can Afghanistan be such a serious uh, center of disruption, jihad, et cetera? The cauldron in, mid, in the Middle East, in Syria, in Iraq, in uh, uh, all these territories which has been going on for so long, with everybody involved in it, is a different story. But the one thing that did not happen is any sort of a major jihad in any, uh, stretching out from there. It, it remained there. It kept on boiling inside. As for the uh, Islamic State Khorasan, yes, that is trying to challenge, or at any rate, differs from Taliban. They, there is a certain rivalry between them. 
and they might have a larger pan-Islamic idea in mind. But where are the resources for all of them in any sense to make it effective? Not at all. There will be a local disturbance constantly. And if they're going to be serious, it is only when Pakistan actually sponsors them, as, as will happen in Kashmir. But then Pakistan has been doing it all the time. There's nothing special about it. Uh, whether the Taliban is in charge of Afghanistan, whether Islam, uh, Islamic State is in charge of Afghanistan, it is finally always the ISI that is doing the job. And uh, they are just recruiting somebody from Afghanistan to do it. Agents can come from everywhere, from Syria, from Egypt, from Chechnya, from the Taliban also. But that doesn't mean it is the Taliban doing it. It doesn't mean Afghanistan is doing it. So it doesn't make that much of a difference. And we must always bear in mind Afga uh, America plays both sides. It is on the side of the Taliban. It is on the side of Ash Ashraf Ghani. It talks democracy through one side of its mouth and it talks jihad through the other side. So we have it both ways. And, that is, and all these places are in a state of perpetual turmoil, civil war, international war, terrorism, and so on. It gives America ample scope for constant intervention. It keeps everybody else out, keeps Russia out mainly, which is a fundamental objective always. And it keeps, I suppose, the American uh, military economy in good condition. A lot of money is used. Yeah. But you know, that, that's uh, again, I, I'm going to pick up one part of what you said that America playing both sides. Mm -hmm. you know, has been a characteristic, say, of the way in which imperial America has okay. conducted itself after World War II. Now, I want to look at these two phases, you know, the Cold War and the equivalent of the post-Cold War. And I'm only, I'm thinking aloud as you were speaking, that if we were to look at this part of recent history, it's again very interesting, you know, talking about the United States and the strategic culture that actually plays both sides while ostensibly trying to deal with a certain ideology. During the Cold War, we spoke about communism, you know, containing communism, containing the former Soviet Union, wherever, particularly in our part of the world, in Southeast Asia, in West Asia, in Egypt, you know, there was this constant anxiety that it is the domino theory, that if one piece falls, then communism will spread, and therefore the United States has to hold the line. Now, again, I'm picking up your phrase, playing both sides. It's very ironic at one level, or it's, I would say, devilish in terms of being astute, you know, to the point of raising it to an absurd level, that the United States was dealing with communism as represented by the former Soviet Union, but it was quite happy to invest in China, which also subscribed to the communist ideology. And you had the latter part of the Cold War, and the irony to me as a security analyst is that in this phase, in the 20th century, the United States has been constantly talking about the rise of China as a major security threat. So if I were to pick up this as the correspondence and say that, yes, the United States played both sides in dealing with Moscow to contain it and yet getting into bed with China for whatever part of the Henry Kissinger Nixon plan that we had. And today, the United States is talking about the threat that China poses. Is it possible that having played both sides of the ideology of jihad, going back to the Cold War, going back to the Soviet Union, going back to the textbooks of Nebraska, which were actually propagating the software of jihad. And after all, both Osama bin Laden and ironically Haqqani were protégés of the United States. So what do you make of this as a historian? Is it only the, you know, deviousness, the turpitude of the American system that allows them to allow their soldiers to be killed while the military industrial complex is making money? I mean, to me, that seems, uh, I'm finding it difficult to accept it, but is it that devilish the way the American system works? What is your view as a historian? Uh, states are always devilish and cynical. The point is, what is the kind of loss that they can accept for themselves? Now, when Americans' lives are lost, the numbers matter, and they have to restrict that number. So direct engagement in wars is always a difficult matter for the United States, unless it is a major war like the Second World War. 
where its uh, existence was supposedly measured. Anyway, it was directly attacked and it had to respond. Uh, the v Vietnam experience showed that it cannot afford to have so many losses. It, it will lose on the home front. So uh, a limited number of losses is possible. But for the rest, playing both sides is typical of many great powers uh, throughout history. It, it, it gives you a degree of flexibility, a capacity of uh, powers of uh, intervention as and when you choose. You prop up one uh, proxy or agent and you pull him down and put up another one. This happens all along the borders of great empires, wherever we study it. Uh, you can go as far back as you want, from the ancient Egyptian through the Roman, through the Byzantine, the Russian, the Chinese, you name it, it is all done. The British also, by the way. What were they doing in the Northwest Frontier all the time? Just this. So, uh, and in that context, what you said about the uh, Cold War, uh, playing both sides, ideologically it did. It supported China, which was completely a hardline communist against the Soviet Union. It is not the ideology which matters, which it is actually the center of power which matters. And the greater center of power was the Soviet Union, and therefore that is the one which had to be attacked and pulled down. And you, uh, uh, draw in the assistance of somebody who's prepared to be with you, even if they're ideologically opposed. Something like setting a thief to catch a thief. Everybody mm -hmm. knows the trick. And uh, the same way it was done here. Ideologically doesn't matter. And America's famous for recruit creating dictatorships everywhere while talking democracy. A democratic ideology is always generating dictatorships and the worst form of dictatorships. So this happens throughout. Now, there's one more variant of that. It creates the jihad to defeat the Soviet Union. It sustains the jihad for various uh, purposes, as and when it wants it can uh, turn on the tap and switch it off. Uh, it has the Pakistanis doing it for them. Pakistan remon remains an important state for being uh, uh, required to intervene in Afghanistan when required. Mm -hmm. The main point is to hold Afghanistan and to prevent somebody else taking over. That somebody else is Russia. Possibly China now, but I do not know if China has any political ambition of that order. Russia at one time did. But the idea is to hold off Russia and keep Afghanistan firmly under control. Now, whether you do it through Ashraf Ghani and Hamid Karzai or through the ISI, Taliban, and so on, well, that's a matter of tactical movement at that moment. Otherwise, it just continues. And they're all useful. You know, it's very interesting what you're saying because over the last few hours, literally, I would say this morning when I was looking at social media, it's interesting that as far as the regional, the neighbors are concerned for Afghanistan Taliban and the resistance that we saw in Panshi, represented by the non Pashtun factions, the only country that seems to have raised its voice is Iran, which has cautioned the Taliban about largely because I would say proximity and also saying that the same thing that was said in the United Nations Security Council resolution about an inclusive government and carry all factions, et cetera, et cetera. But the irony to me, as I was hearing that part of the news is that the United States has designated Iran as a sponsor of terror. And today it is engaging you know, with the Taliban, even if it is to bring back the last of the Americans. But I think this is a reflection of the real polity and the kind of cynicism that prevails when we talk about major powers and great powers and how they conduct themselves. But you are the expert on Russia, on the Soviet Union model. So when you look at the Afghan experience and the penchant or the tendency of major powers, great powers to play both sides, what about the Soviet experience? What about the Russian experience? You know, Moscow as the inheritor, the pedigree of great power. How has it conducted itself and what is it likely to do because of the same compulsion of power? Because now Russia is more aligned to China, which incidentally was aligned with the United States during the latter part of the Cold War. So this, you know, shifting kind of partnerships or promiscuity, if you will, in a strategic sense. What is your reading of how Moscow is going to orient itself in this US-China game? 
Well, in uh, Afghanistan, I think uh, we can see that Russia has been rather passive. Uh, generally in Central Asia, it has been passive. China has been uh, most active on the economic front, investment and so on in the uh, uh, Belt Initiative. The problem is for Russia that she is so bogged down in the West, in Europe. Ukraine, Crimea, and so on are keeping Russia extremely busy. And Russia is on the verge of losing Ukraine or having Ukraine partitioned and facing the heat there. Uh, Afghanistan is not uh, an area it wishes to engage in uh, in the way it had earlier. Uh, at best, uh, join hands with others in seeking a stable government there and nothing more. Uh, Russia is playing a very weak hand. So it is not being active about it. It will just join with the other powers and uh, uh, utter many platitudes about the necessity of stability, about uh, inclusive government, I'm sure, and so on, I'm sure. Uh, generally, to see that uh, uh, the uh, extreme image of uh, the Taliban does not become a reality, and so on. But it's not going to do very much more. If anything, China might be a bit more active, but China uh, is not going to be politically active very much. It is really only supporting Pakistan uh, to do so. Uh, and everyone is letting Pakistan handle it. So if anyone uh, takes the rap, it will be Pakistan again. China and the US are behind Pakistan and it suits them that Pakistan is ready to do so. And Pakistan is sufficiently adventurous to want to do so. Uh, what exactly it will get out of Afghanistan is not certain, uh, except that it keeps India out. Yeah. That is a strategic game. That's all. Uh, otherwise, there's nothing else to be got from Afghanistan. So uh, Russia is passive. China is more active, but in a very li limited sphere. But And it is uh, relying upon backing Pakistan. And nothing more than that, I think. You know, I think this is so different your perspective, Madhavan, from what you see. I think we are all under this onslaught of breaking news. And I think if you take one part of India's television channels, it appears as if there is this huge threat that is knocking at the Indian door. And you have placed this in a completely different, I would say, in a more objective and I would say in a more calm manner. But this is the last question that I want to sort of leave with you and request you for a response. India and the Taliban. Now, again, maybe I'm guilty of constantly pushing the security dimension, but you remember Taliban 1.0 as it is being referred to when we had Mr. Vajpayee as the prime minister. And December 1999, the ignominy of India having to deal with the Taliban and hand over certain terrorists to them. Today in 2021, I keep saying that this is actually Taliban 1.0, but with cell phones. That is the difference, you know, this is a different Taliban, but the ideology, the commitment remains much the same. And we see this in the interim government. As a historian, what is it that you are able to sort of perhaps, you know, read the subtext when you talk about India and the relevance for India of having the Taliban? Is it a distant country which has no relevance except in relation to Pakistan? Or is there any possibility that this fervor of jihad, the tribalism, that the flag of the Taliban is now fluttering in Kabul on the 20th anniversary of 911. Will it lead to a kind of revival of this fervor, the so-called sleeper cells? You know, there are many interpretations about the anxiety. After all, it is true that from 2001 after 9-11, India went through the Mumbai experience in 2008. Different parts of Europe, Spain, France, UK, even as we speak, there is a trial going on in Paris where the suspect in the Paris attack is actually claiming to be a foot soldier of the Islamic State. So is it possible that we might see some eruption because of the triumphalism of the 20th anniversary of 9-11? And I'm only requesting you to look at India. Yeah. Madhav? Uh, about 9-11, that's another matter. But let me speak about India. I just do not understand why we are beating our breasts so much. Uh, as if some major disaster has occurred. Look at uh, Afghanistan, a hopelessly impoverished country uh, without any resources, living on the export of drugs and little else.
And here we are in, in India. Look at the uh, contrast in resources, capacities, and so on. Why are we so terrified about what is happening in Kabul? And doesn't it occur to anyone that whatever happens, anybody who's ruling Kabul would like to have India as a friend. However much they are uh, inspired by jihadi ideology and so on, at some point they have to run the state. If you wish to run the state, you look around for friends. And India is an obvious candidate, at least a neutral one, shall we say, it has to be. So India is not, I don't know, I do not understand why we are so terrified and so uh, reactive to this. Uh, the only point is Pakistan has an advantage and Pakistan will continue to use its uh, assets. That is all that's going to happen. It's not the Taliban victory which is going to make the big change. Pakistan will be encouraged a bit, where it will continue to do so, and has always done so. And Pakistan has always a backing of the US. So we are, it's the US we have to worry about, They're not Taliban and Afghanistan. I mean, the problem rises in the US supporting Pakistan, Pakistan cross-sponsoring commanders in uh, Kashmir, and well, you get recruits in uh, perhaps in Afghanistan, you'll get it in many other countries. The IS is different from Taliban. That is much more pan-Islamic. It has a wider area of action, but even then it has been focusing on the Middle East itself and in Europe. Their connection is there, not with India. Of course, there might be an offshoot moving in this direction, but they're more bothered about the manner in which the Europeans are treating Muslims and the manner in which the US and uh, European forces have intervened in the whole of the Middle East and made it so violent, so unstable, and reduced it to such shambles in every way. Uh, the IS, why, why should the Islamic State be interested in India? What is there to worry about? Uh, unless we go about attacking Muslims on the same scale as the Europeans do. If we do that, we will get them lost. <laughs> Sorry. Otherwise, I don't think India is a target at all. India is a target only from Pakistan, from nobody else, essentially. Arvind, I want to thank you, you know, for offering what I would call as a very fresh perspective. There are many things that you said. I shall listen to this whole thing all over again. And I think the way you have framed the role of the United States and the fact that for India, in many ways, it's a lonely perch that we are dealing with the United States providing support both to Pakistan and to the Taliban in a very roundabout and elliptical way. And we are also dealing with the China, yeah. which is the post-Galwan context. And I think personally that for China, if there is one single objective, which is very large, it is to minimize and reduce India's own relevance and influence in Afghanistan. But I think in that sense, the way you have framed it is uh, very interesting. And I hope that your optimism is borne out. And you know, you're a historian, so maybe we will come back to you at the appropriate time to see whether many of the issues that you have identified pan out in the way that has been suggested. But on that note, I'd like to thank you, Professor Palak, for your time and this conversation with Sam. And thank you for watching Sam Conversations. We'll be back again with another subject. Thank you. Thank you, Mother. Thank you very much.